Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen and I'm the Program Manager for the Recycling Market Center and I will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition for providing technical support. Today's webinar focus is on the post-consumer plastic resin supply chain. Following this presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel of your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Patty Moore, president and CEO of Moore Recycling and Associates, Inc., a company that she founded in 1989 while she was completing her MS in resource management and administration from the University of Antioch, New England's Environmental Studies Department. Patty has been involved in the field of recycling since 1983, when she became fascinated with the commonality, variety, and value of waste while working at the Wilton Recycling Center in Wilton, New Hampshire. She was the principal author of How to Implement a Plastics Recycling Program, published by the Council for Solid Waste Solutions in 1991. Since then, she has not once looked back in her efforts to advance the number and type of materials collected for recycling on both a local and global scale. Ms. Moore was a participant in the Department of Commerce Plastics Trade and Investment Mission to China in 1996 and continues to have a strong interest and understanding of the critical role played by China and other developing nations in domestic recycling efforts. Under her leadership, Moore Recycling Associates has had a huge impact on current recycling systems while managing to maintain a small staff of professionals. And Patty, I'll hand the program over to you. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here today. Um, it's uh, especially timely uh, to talk about this because of uh, uh, what's happening in China. So we'll get there. I guarantee you we'll be talking about that. So uh, I'm going to break my discussion up into uh, um, first talking about PET packaging. Um, then I'll talk about HTPE bottles. Uh, then non-bottle rigid plastics film. Uh, go into some of the trends and then talk about the gaps and then we'll have questions and answers after that. So I wanted to start just by giving you a general overview of what drives uh, post-consumer plastic um, uh, resin markets um, and as you'd expect um, uh, the value of natural gas and petroleum and derivatives through the virgin materials chain um, have an impact on the price as well as the general economic conditions and um, but the two things that I think have the biggest impact I believe have the biggest impact in, in, uh, is um, the availability of off-spec material which can be a lower cost speed stock uh, and um, many users will use it um, in place of recycled or vice versa um, but these days, even more important than that is the demand for content um, uh, because either they're legislated, as in California, where you have to, many, many plastic products have to include content, recycled content, or um, uh, businesses that have greenhouse gas reduction goals um, or, uh, and find that using recycled material will help them meet that goal, those goals or uh, the growing interest in consumer demand. There was a time when we felt consumer demand was not really a driver, but what we're finding is that uh, it has become more so uh, recently um, there is a growing consumer base that does care about this uh, and not just saying they care, but they'll actually um, speak with their with their purchases and buy buy material um, because they feel it's uh, more environmental. So I want to uh, talk about PET first, and um, the uh, the biggest thing with PET is that uh, there is far more 
there's now for the first time in ever there's more capacity to process PT um, than there is PT being recycled in the US so uh, this is uh, something that has is a recent change uh, um, and uh, what we're finding is that there is far more demand for the material and um, the good news for those who uh, aren't able to ship material to China anymore is that there is enough capacity in the US um, we don't have to rely on China for our PT recycling it also means that the demand and interest in using an alternative to bottles which would be the PT thermoforms um, that is growing uh, because the um, the users um, the, and buyers of bottles know that uh, that they aren't going to be able to get enough bottles and um, basically because we have this capacity to process material and we're not collecting enough bottles oops go back and therefore the industry, the reclamation industry, is looking at PT uh, thermoforms as a way to supplement. Now, the problem that that what what you have to keep in mind is that the PT is uh, fairly new to recycling, and so it's undergoing uh, the scrutiny that the bottles have undergone for years. Uh, when I first start uh, got involved with uh, plastic recycling um, back in the mid '80s. Um, the reclaimers had to communicate with the buyers, uh, um, the, the manufacturers of bottles, and talk to them about problems like, if you recall back then, the, there were base cups on the PT. Um, and the base cups weren't a problem, but the, the glue that they used to glue the base cup to the bottle was very problematic for the reclaimers. Also, they had problems with bleeding labels. Um, so, uh, the these new thermoform uh, recyclers are having the same problem with glues, labels, inks, um, dyes in the package itself. And um, uh, NAPCOR, uh, the National Association for PET Container um, Resources, has been working with the manufacturers to help them understand what design for recyclability would look like. So. Um, so those problems can be addressed. What is harder to address are the look-alike containers. So um, things like uh, polystyrene, PLA, and uh, PVC, which um, all also sink in water along with the PET. And they look a lot like the PET, but they create problems in the, in the recycling process. Um, uh, specifically when the material is dried, the flake is dried. They, they, they create uh, lumps and they, they, they partially melt because PET melts at a very high temperature. And so it really jams up the dryers and creates lots of problems. Um, so uh, I know that initially this presentation was going to be about PET thermoforms and, and what's happening with them. So I wanted to just give you an idea of where the industry is on that. Um, it would be great if we could just throw all of the PT thermoforms in with the bales, but I don't think the industry is quite ready to do that yet because uh, of these problems with dyes and inks and things like that and with the look-alike containers. And there's a third problem as well that we need to consider, which is the actual dimensions of the, of the material. Um, when you buy bottles, they are all cylindrical and they act a certain way within the processing um, systems that are in place. When you add thermoforms to that mix, you now have all kinds of different shapes and sizes um, that act differently than those cylindrical bottles do. Um, so, uh, so while I'm very um, optimistic and excited about the growth of PET thermoform recycling because the material itself can be um, substituted for bottle material. They're very similar in their properties, um, slightly lower intrinsic value, that's the runniness, 
um, with thermoforms, but that is a problem that is solvable. Um, but it ha but because of these other issues with the, the, the handling, the, the labels, the lookalikes, the PET recycling industry is not ready to just open the doors and say, bring them on. Um, they are working very hard to get to the point where they can handle this material. Um, and there are a number of reclaimers who will allow a certain percentage in with the bottles. Um, there are reclaimers that will buy them separately baled. Uh, so there are markets for the material, strong domestic markets for this material. Um, it's just a really an evolving situation. And you know, so if you're generating these, then you need to work very closely with your buyer to find out how they want them. Do they want them mixed in? Do they allow a certain percentage? Would they prefer they were segregated? Um, so all of those are questions that you need to work on with your particular buyer. Patty, we have a quick question. Uh, someone wants you to explain the term thermoform. Great. A thermoform is really, it's a PET non-bottle. Uh, and thermoform uh, refers to the uh, how it's manufactured. Um, it, basically what happens is that the, the PET resin is um, uh, extruded into rolls, great big rolls of, uh, of sheet, and, and then those to make the product, to thermoform the products, that, that sheet is heated and stretched and formed over a mold. Um, um, so examples of thermoform, PT thermoforms are uh, cake domes, cookie trays, um, also um, containers for, for packaging for products that, that hang, uh, hang on the shelf, uh, cups, a lot of the p cups are made from PET, um, um, you know, that sort of a, a, a material. It's that it's that difficult to open, uh, clear packaging that that we see so much of, uh, and there is a shift from other types of resins into PET that is happening naturally because the because of the properties. Uh, but it is a more expensive than, for example, PVC and polystyrene, and so. Um, that shift from those products into PT is occurring, but it's it's happening slowly. Well, not slowly, um, but it's happening in an at a natural rate, at which business feels that it's in it in their best advantage to switch over to PET. HTP bottles are um, really a very stable recycling material. Um, and uh, uh, you can see since 2006, um, we haven't seen a lot of growth in resin. Um, we've seen a um, little bit of growth in collection, um, but but basically, it's it's not uh, it's it's not really uh, a a material that has a lot going on with it, uh, other than the fact that we're continuing to see. Um, resin sales drop. And because resin sales are dropping, so what you see here is that the amount of reclamation capacity for, P for HTP bottles is very stable because the volume collected has been very stable. Um, we are seeing um, an actual drop in sales um, and that's uh, in pounds. Uh, the good news is that there is a balance between um, Maybe not. There is a, uh, go ahead and go back, a uh, balance between the amount that's being generated and and the, um, oh, I guess not. I must have put it somewhere else. Uh, the um, And the reclamation capacity. So so there's really, like I say, not a, a really a big story to be told with HTPE recycling. Um, film, on the other hand, there is uh, opportunity uh, for growth. Uh, we really are have just uh, uh, captured the, the tip of the iceberg with film uh, uh, recycling. And film would be film wraps, bag, over wrap, all of those materials. Um, so uh, this, this is really 
a material where a lot is going on. Um, More Recycling did an analysis of the opportunity to recycle uh, this material and we found over 15,000 drop-off locations, primarily retail but also um, there were some commercial as some are um, uh, private collection programs and municipal program collection programs for film. Uh, and so there is a strong opportunity for people to recycle not just the bags but also all the other material that they um, will find in the household um, the, like the uh, the bread bags the the over wrap that comes uh, if you buy a flat of can, uh, canned cat food that plastic that you comes around it, the plastic that comes around the, your toilet paper rolls when you buy those, all of those materials are highly recyclable and can be included with the bags uh, in the drop-off programs. Um, but even greater than what is in the household uh, for film is what is in the commercial sector. So um, if you look at where film is generated, especially clean film, you find that it's generated at commercial uh, locations. Every commercial location uh, generates film. Pretty much anywhere you find corrugated, you're going to find film. Um, so what, what we are proposing and working on um, are uh, trying to tap into the commercial uh, recycling uh, collection program so that we can grab this material out of the commercial sector. Um, my experience of all these years being in the recycling industry has shown me that you should build the, the recycling infrastructure around the high volume, high value materials. And then you can bring along the lower volume and lower value materials um, around that infrastructure that you've already built. Um, so in, with the case of film, the high volume, high value material is in the commercial sector. Um, and that's, um, that's what we're trying to do is pr promote and pr uh, the collection of that material um, so that the household material will have a recycling infrastructure to tap into. So you can see that that's happening naturally already. This is the 2011, uh, uh, from the 2011 film and wrap bag recycling report that More Recycling did. So you can see most of the material already be being collected is commercial clear material and then commercial mixed color material. Um, you also see the next biggest chunk of it is the, the mixed material from retails where a grocery store will collect uh, film and bags at the front of the store and then take it back to the back of the store and combine it with their pallet wrap and, and sell that. Um, so between those three categories you can see that, that that's where most of the film that is being captured exists. Um, and we haven't even begun to fight. There is still a lot of material out there that is to be captured. Um, primarily from uh, lower uh, volume uh, locations like malls and, and places like that and more recycling is working very hard with coming up with a template um, working with the flexible film recycling group that is housed in ACC to come up with a template um, on how um, how you can capture that material in, in maybe a downtown or a strip mall or a regional mall using a um, a large store as the base and getting the other stores to feed back into it. Um, so you'll be hearing more about this uh, as we progress with our efforts. Oh, I also want to say that most of the film that is uh, generated uh, is polyethylene and so we really at this point are going are trying to capture the polyethylene film, both low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene and um, have not moved yet uh, dramatically uh, into the other material, other types of film, but if you look at what's generated, most of it's polyethylene anyway. So we found that in 2011, uh, over a billion pounds of PET polyethylene film were collected in the U.S. 
um, but you can see that the uh, uh, operating capacity and annual capacity for handling that is under that. So we are in a situation where we do need to look at building uh, film infrastructure. And uh, I think, again, we're in a good position today because of the green fence to um, that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, because um, material is more likely to stay domestic so that that will be uh, more advantageous to invest in that infrastructure. And I'll talk more about that as we go along. Patty, another quick question. Silly... Patty, another quick sure. question about film. Uh, you're talking about the number two and number four code film. Yeah, polyethylene, high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene. That's correct. Okay. Primarily. Thank you. There are other films, like polypropylene as well. Um, is, is a, a fairly large category of material, and some of the uh, markets can take polypropylene or a certain percentage of polypropylene in with polyethylene, but it's very market specific. So let's talk about rigids. This is an interesting, an interesting category because it's really a catch-all. Uh, and I think that pretty soon we're going to have to divide this up in a, in a more logical way. But um, this is really a, um, everything else that's not that's not a bottle or film or foam. Um, though actually, I think foam is actually included in this. I think going forward, we're going to start uh, reporting on it separately. But um, you can see that um, uh, um, we're close to a billion pounds of non-bottle rigids, and. I need to let you know that in part this growth in how much is here um, recovered year over year is due to us uh, more recycling just finding more of the material. Um, uh, there has been really since uh, I, uh, since uh, plastic started to be um, manufactured here in the US people have recycled it. Um, and they have recovered it. Now you have industrial scrap recycling, which is where you can essentially put it back into the same application immediately. But there is a ton of commercial scrap plastic out there, and that would be materials that um, have met their intended use. Uh, for example, transport packaging, um, uh, things like hangers um, and and uh, other commercial, I, I, I can't even come up with how many different things there are, <laughs> um, strapping, things like that, that, that uh, never make it to a consumer per se, a household, they make it to a commercial consumer. And the recycling of that material has been going on and continues to go on. Again, um, I come back to my point where you start with the high value, high volume material, and then we'll work the the, the household material into that infrastructure. So we've been trying to document that because no one ever documented it. It's a little frustrating you hear all the time, oh, plastic has such a low recycling rate. It's, it's such a loser material when it comes to recycling. And yet, um, I really think it's an issue of not documenting. If you compare uh, paper, the paper industry and the, in, in the steel industry, they, when they report, they talk about all the commercial material and they include that in, in their reporting. Um, I saw a really good report, an annual report by ISRI where they actually very clearly delineate what's in and what's not in. And a lot of it is, um, is commercial material. So this is an effort that we feel is extremely important to, to really just show how much is going on. And even more than just showing, what we can do is start tapping into that existing infrastructure um, to get more and more of the household plastics recycled. So you can see that uh, this is also for 2011. Um, that uh, a, the largest portion of, of what is uh, recycled is single resins. Um, and um, some of the growth is not just commercial growth. We found growth in, uh, I believe it was um, uh, poly, um, polyethylene and, uh, um, and PET recycling, largely through the PET thermoforms, which are now in this, this mix um, of materials. Um, so, uh, but that blue 61% is primarily commercial, not entirely, but primarily um, be, 
Um, and then, uh, and most of that, if you'll, you'll see in the next uh, slide, I believe, um, ends up being used here in the US. Uh, so again, you can see as we jumped up in our volume, because we were able to document the commercial stream, what we saw is that a higher percentage is staying domestic. Um, so this tells me that the further segregated materials are, the more likely they are to end up uh, as a uh, as a material that can be reclaimed here in the U.S. Um, the story though here for uh, the non-bottle material is that while we saw 900, a little over 900 million pounds collected and found um, uh, you know, 760 million pounds of capacity, um, almost none of that U.S. operating capacity um, can handle mixed material. Um, that is all um, for, well, for highly mixed material. Um, some of it may take some subset of, uh, of uh, mixed material. For example, uh, it could be olefins only, the polyethylene, the polypropylene, um, or it could be um, high density and low density or something like that. But um, it's not just a mixed, a complete mixed resin, res resin bale there is not, no capacity to deal with that in the U.S. Um, there, the, the operating cap capacity in Canada can take a more mixed bale, but in, the reason that is in Canada is that uh, there was money by the Continuous Improvement Fund, the, the government, that uh, capitalized um, the, the production of that uh, so they capitalized putting in facilities to handle that mixed material. Um, I know of no such uh, capitalization programs in the U.S. Therefore, we don't have um, that capacity. But um, there is a lot of interest in this scrap, an amazing amount of interest. I have been getting calls regularly for a while, and I think that we're going to um, see some uh, ability to uh, process here in the U.S. some of that material. So uh, let's talk about the trends since that's what I started to, if you could go forward, um, about what I see kind of happening and and why I'm, despite the green fan, is very optimistic about how, where we're heading as a, as a country with our recycling. Um, a few trends. One is that because um, of the reduction in paper, uh, most strongly newspaper. There have been dramatic drop in newspaper over the last few years, but um, we're seeing that shift now happen with corrugated cardboard as well uh, because um, of interest in reducing greenhouse gases when you can lightweight your package by going, say, from a corrugated box to a, a plastic film or pouch you use far less energy and resources. So there's a strong interest in moving away from paper toward plastic. And we're seeing that um, hit the MRFs, which are designed around the paper capacity. Um, and this trend started several years ago. I'm sure this is no new news to many of you. What we're seeing is that if you look at the value of material, I think it, it may be on the next slide, um, the, the, the highest value uh, other than the non-ferrous um, metal is the plastic on an on a equal per pound basis. So yeah, the, that brown line that, uh, at the bottom is corrugated cardboard. Now, there are many, many more pounds of corrugated cardboard, but, uh, but it, it, you can see that even the, the low value um, mixed material uh, has a commiserate value to to the cardboard. Um, so the uh, MRF operators realized this a few years ago and began to open the doors to move more and more materials into their um, into their facilities because they knew that they could sell them and make uh, make money to offset some of the loss of lower volume from corrugated newspaper. As I mentioned, fewer bottles per capita. And this is a, a trend that is because of, um, uh, in part because of lightweighting, in part because of um, 
dropping sales, a little bit of dropping sales. Clearly, it was dropping sales between 2007 and 2008. But also um, the use of concentrates um, so that you need a smaller package for the same amount of, uh, of uh, cleaning power. Um, so we, we are seeing that this, this is on pounds per, uh, per person per year um, that we are using less bottles. Um, and that, as I mentioned, is pushing into the trend of what other materials are there available for me to uh, capture uh, within my facility, whether I'm a HTP recycler or a PT recycler. Um, um, so that fewer bottles per capita has, has uh, pushed the trend of increase in interest, and, and the high value has pushed the trend of increase uh, interest in the collection of non-bottles. And this is um, now uh, a slide that includes New York City in it. Uh, so the 100 most populous cities, you can see um, all of them collect at least PET and HTPE. So um, we're now close to 80% of them collecting beyond that. Um, and uh, um, this is a trend that uh, you can see in a very quick period of time has, has really um, grown where, where, where organizations want to go beyond just the, the, just the bottles. The other thing we're seeing is uh, communities moving away from um, um, the resident identification code because they're finding that it is uh, creating confusion. Now not every community is moving away because if you have and uh, if you collect, for example, only PET and HDPE bottles, then you are going to want to still let people know. Um, some will still want to let people know what, what the code is. Um, but but my, my experience has been that it, it's being used, the code is being used improperly in many cases. For example, um, communities that take all bottles and containers, which in this example here is the least inclusive. Um, uh, though there are less inclusive, but in this example it's the least inclusive. Uh, you can, I will often see outreach and education saying, we take all bottles and plastic containers one through seven. Now, there's no reason to use the term one through seven. The resin identification code is not does not indicate whether or not something is able to be recycled. All it is is telling um, someone who cares to look what the base resin is that was used to manufacture that. Um, so there's no, if you are collecting all of them, there's absolutely no reason to use the resin identification code. All it does is um, confuse people um, who are trying to find it on the bottom of a bottle and you know how teeny weeny it is on some of those plastic uh, packages um, and it's very difficult to find and to see and um, I have seen anecdotally time after time where people look for the code they can't find it so they throw away the package um, I, um, I believe and many with me believe that we're better off to give people clues both visual in this case or by material type as to what packages that we want. Um, now there are still cases where people need to use the number as I said and I have moved away from my position that I took at one point of let's just do away with the darn thing it's nothing but trouble um, because I'm told by some uh, of the, um, the recyclers that they still use the code uh, because they um, may see a new package come along and they're curious as to know what what that code is, so some of the sorters and some of the recyclers. Um, and also there are still a lot of communities in this country that are only collecting number one and number two PET and HTPE, so they still have need of the code for outreach. Um, but this is the direction that I see the communities going, is moving away from the code and, and really just moving toward telling people what, what products that you want. See, now many of you are probably interested in China. Um, what, what I'm finding is that um, we're seeing two trends in China, uh, clearly the green fence, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the fact that it is getting more expensive to do business in China, and I think those two are linked clearly. Um, 
but um, the, uh, there is a strong infrastructure in China for recycling scrap plastic, uh, um, but um, there is a, is a uh, need to move beyond the hand sort method. Um, the lower right hand corner is a help wanted poster um, in an area in southern China where they were offering, I'm told, higher than prevailing wages, but they still had trouble finding workers because um, uh, the, the, the work is not very fantastic work. Um, the, the woman in the upper right is a, um, a PhD uh, and she has her PhD and is, works in a lab. And the woman in the lower left is a, manages a uh, a uh, warehouse manager. So there are good jobs that are involved with with recycling plastic as well as not so great jobs. So there are regulations, existing regulations in China uh, for the control of plastic scrap. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, those for uh, for not the first time but for the First time and more serious, most seriously, we're seeing those being um, being enforced, and that's primarily uh, because there is a new president in China, and he is very interested in dealing with the issue of pollution. Um, China has gotten um, to the point where they have a populace that is is not happy with the, the water, food, soil, and air pollution. I've had several people tell me that the reason that they believe that this current crackdown is stronger than other crackdowns is because uh, of the smog in Beijing that is so bad that you don't get to see the sun for months on end um, we, uh, and uh, that the body of the central government is based in Beijing and they have to breathe that air every day. Um, so as I said, there there have been a series of regulations. The first time I visited China in 96 was right after they prohibited the importation of unprocessed plastic scrap in China. Um, and clearly a lot of unprocessed plastic scrap has moved into China since 1996. Um, but um, they have that law on the books and uh, has been modified somewhat over time um, where PET bottles can be brought in if they're not processed, um, but that's the only uh, legally can be imported. Um, uh, but what the, the, the Chinese EPA is trying to do is to put sets of regulations around the whole the whole business, not just the importation of material, but also how it's handled once it gets there, who's doing it, and to make sure that they are handling it in an environmental manner. Um, and um, you can see through the years these sets of regulations have been passed and is slowly implemented. What we see now, if you could uh, forward please, is that um, the green fence has come down and um, they are strictly uh, controlling the importation of unprocessed scrap. And there we go, uh, there's that green fence. So um, they, well, I have seen prohibitions in the past. Um, the, um, this one feels different to me and it, and it feels, uh, and I know that sounds sort of swishy, but um, sometimes with China all you can do is go by feelings because it's not the most transparent place to do business. Um, I have heard people tell People say that this this recent crackdown will slow down in November, um, and that could well be. Uh, but I think that that largely has to do with the paper um, that between now and November they are really inspecting the paper uh, bales that are coming into China to make sure that they are um, cleaner. Um, and I'm sure that this is something that the uh, paper mills wish had happened a long time ago, the U.S. paper mills, uh, <laughs> because uh, it's been too long that uh, the MRFs have been able to bail up uh, material of uh, questionable quality and send it into China. And you can't blame the MRFs because the people were buying it. Uh, they were buying it and there was far more demand than supply. Um, so whenever you're in a position like that, 
um, uh, you uh, you can get away with uh, with more contamination. Um, so uh, that's why I believe that uh, this this green fence coming down, while painful in the short term, is going to be very positive in the long term. Um, and um, let me tell you a little bit more about why I think it's going to be helpful. Um, in part because we haven't seen that investment in uh, the infrastructure here in the U.S. Uh, from the standpoint of both at the MRF level and at the reclaimer level to handle um, what we've been expanding in our collection programs. At, at the MRF level, I still see a lot of MRFs that were doing a negative sort at the end with their plastic. So in other words, they would positively sort the PET, they would positively sort the HDPE, then they would pull out any contamination out of what was remaining and let it drop so that that, that bale of non-bottle rigids was largely contaminated with, with MRF residue because they couldn't possibly get it all out and yet they were able to sell that. Domestic, potential domestic users of that mixed material cannot handle that level of, of contamination. And clearly what we were doing is just taking uh, you know, uh, some of the, our residue and, and shipping it to China and letting them deal with it. Um, they were able to, 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 to extract the valuable material because of low cost labor, um, but they didn't really have a good way to deal with the residue, um, which could be anywhere from 15, 20, 30. We commonly saw 30%, and in one case, we, we sorted a negative, uh, we did a series of bale sorts, a negatively um, uh, generated uh, bale at the end of a MRF, and it was over 60% non-plastic, um, and yet they were calling it a quote-unquote three through seven bale. Um, so that clearly is not, gonna, people are not going to be able to do that anymore um, and are going to have to develop uh, bales that uh, can meet domestic specifications. Um, so uh, we'll talk some more about that in a minute. Uh, let's see. Um, so here's some more trends. Clearly, as I mentioned, there's that interest in content. Um, and it's primarily uh, today being driven by the greenhouse gas uh, reduction and by consumer demand. Um, the, the bail quality dropping is, is as I've described, and, um, and uh, I'm hopeful we'll see a turnaround in that trend. Um, and I've had people tell me that waste to oil technology is the answer to all of this, and I maintain that it is an answer to very specific streams of material. Um, because the waste to oil technology is primarily looking for the olefin fraction, and that's the polyethylene and the polypropylenes. And if a, someone generates a fairly clean stream of polyethylene and polypropylene, there are higher end markets that can use that material into extruded or uh, uh, com, uh, uh, into products that are extruded or pr uh, compression molded products. Um, uh, that that have uh, wide specifications, and uh, they, those buyers have uh, the ability to take that material uh, and pay a lot more than the waste to oil folks can. Um, but there are certain streams uh, that will make sense to go into the waste to oil. That said, and generally those streams would be uh, 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 um, commercial streams that that make sense. So. Okay, uh, so why, how, what do we need um, to, to make plastic recycling successful going forward? This is uh, something that I often show, many of you may have seen this before, and uh, this is, uh, I would like to give credit to Dave Cornell for coming up with this and helping, helping me frame things. So basically you need enough raw material that is identifiable and um, uh, can be separated, and uh, the technology to both do that separation and to convert it into a raw material that can go into a profitable product. And obviously you need investment in each of these sections and it's that investment piece I believe that is, uh, has been missing recently. Um, I think we have 
um, a lot of information about the other three, but not the investments. So let me explain why. Um, it hasn't happened because uh, primarily the economic uh, uh, mark marketplace, uh, the economic uh, what's the word I'm searching for? I apologize. <laughs> Uh, environment uh, has not really lent itself to investment um, uh, and and uh, clearly with the green fence down we really need uh, to expand our sortation and re reclamation. Could you go forward please? And here's why the environment has not, uh, economic environment has not been there. In part, it's because of plastic scrap being sold on the spot market basis. And this is both ends. This is some people who buy the bales, buy them on a spot market, and, and then the reclaimers are selling the material to the end users on a spot market basis. And that is a very untenable position for them to be in. And if they want to expand and they go to a bank and they ask for money to upgrade or expand, it's very hard to make a good case to a bank when you have no guaranteed supply and you have no guaranteed sale. This is what we were talking about, obviously. Uh, the problem is that uh, these same people, the reclaimers who are buying on the spot market, have not been able to enforce their bail specifications back down to the generators because they were able to uh, so if, if I was a buyer and I tried to impose my spec, um, the generator just said, look, I'm gonna, there's 26 people waiting in line who will be happy to buy it at this, at this spec, so I'm not going to sell to you anymore. So it made it very difficult to, to enforce bail specifications. And this is not just for the low value material. Go ahead and move. It was also for the PET and high value material and the, and the single resin items. Those guys couldn't control their specs either. So all along the, 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 the value chain, it was, it was very difficult to, to have a good uh, ability to control the input of material. Um, part of the problem is the terminology. Um, both ends of the terminology, both the outreach terminology and also what we call this. I often hear people refer to certain bales as three through seven bale. Um, I maintain there is no such thing as a three through seven bale because every three through seven bale that anybody's ever talked to me about also has uh, HDPE and PET in it which are number ones and number twos. Um, so I think, I also hear one through seven bales, um, but they're really meaningless terms and so we I've uh, been working with the uh, Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers to come up with a, a standard set of terminology and standard bail specifications for the full range of types of plastics that are being collected and sold in the marketplace today. Um, I'm hopeful those, uh, those uh, bail specifications and terminology have been approved and um, uh, are in uh, uh, at the point where now, in my opinion, politics are, are holding them up um, and, uh, and in part it could be the green fence and people are afraid to, to release a bail spec and a terminology for a bail that cannot currently be sold in the U.S. Um, I maintain that we need to get the terms out there and begin using the terms so if it can't be sold in the U.S., a buyer a U.S. buyer can ask the, the generator what it is and they can at least speak to each other using the same language, but um, um, I'm not in control of things, so, um, but that's my opinion. Uh, we are also working on terminology for outreach. Uh, we have found, as I said, that one through seven, um, use of the term one through seven, which is a meaningless and confusing term to use when you're doing all of the plastic. Um, so we are proposing a different set of terminology. Um, we have, uh, are going to be um, doing additional outreach for, um, uh, for uh, ways to, terms to use for outreach. And so if you're interested in um, answering a survey, I would really encourage anyone here who, who have an interest in this uh, this topic of plastic recycling, especially non-bottle rigid 
plastic recycling, uh, to please um, uh, send me your email and let me know and we will send you a survey to take. It's very simple and it won't take much time, but we want your opinion on what are the right terms to use when we're communicating with the public. And we have uh, developed a system that we feel is flexible enough that every program in the country will have a way to fit into it, into the, the set of terms that we've developed. Um, but, uh, but what we want to do is try to get everybody using the same terms. Um, so please, I encourage you at the end, my, my uh, email will be at the end of the slides if you're interested. We're really looking for feedback because uh, without your feedback and knowing everything that's going on, uh, we will come up with something that doesn't quite work and then it won't be fully adopted. Uh, we need a design for recyclability uh, guidelines. We need them to be both available and adhered to. Um, APR has a set of design for recyclability guidelines for a number of materials, PET bottles, HDPE bottles, PET thermoforms, and um, have just come up with guidelines for the non-bottle um, thin wall plastics like uh, polystyrene and uh, PVC. So that then, and it's just a start uh, for the material um, because there aren't that many places reclaiming it, um, but we have to start somewhere and they will be modified as we learn more about recycling those materials. It just starts with the basics of, of additives, labels, um, and things like that. For example, we know at this point in time uh, that you don't want to put a degradable additive in any plastic um, uh, because because of concerns with its ability to be recycled and turned into a new product um, that can be used over time without having to worry about falling apart through that degradable additive. So um, uh, that's something that's in all of these specs. Uh, I'd like to understand better um, the effectiveness and economics of PERFs. We uh, don't have them in this country. As I said, in, in Canada they do, but um, it, it's proprietary information. Um, I would like to see more information publicly about how they might work, what set of materials make sense to segregate, how many you know, near-infrared units do you need, what is the, um, if you could go forward, what is the outcome of that? If you were to segregate, for example, um, all of the, um, all of the uh, polystyrene into a uh, into one a bale. What would the properties of that polystyrene be? Would it have uh, properties that could then be turned into a new product? If so, what are those new products? Uh, same with polypropylene. We don't know. Polypropylene has very wide specific uh, array of specifications. The polypropylene that's out there, everything from fractional melt polypropylene to uh, to 120, 140 melt polypropylene, and so. What do we need to do? We need to learn. What do we need to do to, to uh, maximize the value of that material? In China, what I saw was they would segregate um, by size first, then by, uh, by material type, uh, excuse me, product shape. Um, so they would do size, then shape, then resin. And, and the reason they did that was both it's easy for uh, hand sorters. You can, you, can, you can train someone to do something by size, by shape, and, and then by resin and color. Um, but, but the other thing it does is it puts like materials together. And therefore, the array of properties within those segregated materials is going to be more narrow. Um, Right now, most uh, MRFs already segregate the very bulky, the bulky material at the front end of their uh, MRFs, and um, and therefore they end up with something with similar properties. All those large, bulky items. Um, so we really need to do the the learning of what are the set of of sorts that we need to do to end up with material that has value. And then uh, let's say we do that, we also need to know the demand for those materials. Um, Association of Post-Consumer Plastic Recyclers again did a, a, a report they call the Fit for Use. It's on their website. And basically what they did is they asked the reclaimers first, what, what kind of polypropylene could you, what, what 
categories could you generate? And they looked at things like uh, color and um, uh, uh, FT, uh, FTA um, compa uh, compatibility uh, or ability to, to meet uh, food contact um, and other uh, melt flow, things like that. So they came up with a general set of, of properties and then they asked end users to please, you know, that are currently using virgin material, well, how much if we created this category with these col this color and this spec, how much of it could you use in your your system? And they, by doing this uh, simple exercise, they found over a billion pounds of demand for polypropylene. Now, granted, most of that billion pounds was for uh, food contact polypropylene, but uh, uh, you know F the FDA polypropylene. But I think it's an exercise that needs to be. Um, uh, conducted for other materials um, beyond polypropylene. The other thing that needs to happen is that um, we need the, the, the converters. The converters are the people who make the products. Um, they take resin and they convert it into a new product um, or package. And we need to educate them about what they need to do in order to use recycled content. Um, what people don't realize is that um, it's not, you know, the, the converters are, are perhaps under pressure to use content, they go out into the marketplace and have a very narrow set of specifications for pelletized material that looks just like their vir virgin material. And they come back to me and they say, there isn't any material out there. There's no recyclable, there's no plastic out there, post-consumer resin PCR that I can use in my system. Well, that's true. Um, we need the converters to modify those that are using recycled know that you have to modify your system. Maybe in order to make it affordable you have to be able to handle flake or maybe you need to uh, set up a system where you can blend the recycled in with your virgin. I mean there, there's always modifications that have to be made to use, almost always, to use recycled material unless you want to pay an outrageous price for it. Um, and most people don't. Um, so with a, some a specific set of modifications, then the end users can handle um, the post-consumer resins. Um, so basically, uh, uh, what what this is, uh, and I think I some of you have seen this before. This is Patty's happy future of, of how I think we can get to every bit of plastic recycled. So basically, we have to look at an array of collection. We cannot just collect. Um, uh, at the curbside. Um, there are certain materials that just don't lend themselves to curbside. Um, so um, th that would be uh, certain materials may lend themselves to curbside. The rigid plastics for sure. Maybe EPS. I'm, I'm still um, considering that one. It has the advantage of being a very visually uh, obvious material and it has the advantage of being clear. Um, so, um, but it has some disadvantages too, as you know, the lightweight and uh, um, being primarily the, the problem. Um, but then the retail and drop-off programs need to be expanded. Um, uh, we, we know we can collect a lot of film, but are there other materials that make sense? Uh, special collection programs for electronics, uh, where electronics is, is being collected. Why aren't we collecting the EPS? Anytime you buy a new TV, um, you want to get rid of your old one, or a new computer, and you want to get your old one, you're generating EPS at the same time. So those should be co-collected. Um, the bulky rigids, uh, you know, the, the lawn furniture, the kiddie pools, the, the play structures, all those things have a high value, um, but they clearly don't lend themselves to curbside. Then you look at your commercial, which absolutely is essential for a variety of materials. Um, and then if we have the, we go down to what we need, we need those uh, designed for recyclability that are both clear, achievable, and followed. We need uh, to develop the infrastructure uh, for uh, PERFs, and, and we need uh, the plastic recycling facility that can take in certain mixed materials and end up um, uh, selling either clean flake or baled material out into the uh, marketplace. And then, as I said, plastic to oil has a place in that in that stream. Um, so that's my little happy future and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you Patty. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. 
and uh, I'll I'll go through them. I've screened quite a few of them and answered some questions already. But uh, for the ones that we do not get to, we will uh, uh, we'll get those to Patty, and she can answer them offline. So here we yes, go. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, this question has to do with bottles. Uh, they are mostly clear or green, but thermoform is often black. Is this a problem? I have heard that some people have difficult time moving black thermoforms. Yes, that is correct. Black is a problem. Um, it's a problem for a number of reasons. One is that the, the near-infrared um, auto detection systems, which uh, determine what resin it is, do not work well with black. Um, there are some. There is some new technology that's coming out um, that may be able to address that. But the current infrastructure that's in place uh, does not. It is near infrared, and and it won't identify black. Um, uh, the other problem with black is that it's black, which means that you can turn it into something that is black. Uh, once you put the color into plastic, you can't take it out. You can only go to a darker color unless you're going to do something where you actually uh, break down the, uh, you know, chemically recycle it, where you break down the, the uh, polymers into uh, monomers. Um, then you can, then the colorant is, is dispersed. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, and so you are correct. Black uh, thermoforms are an issue that has yet to be solved completely. There are some people who will buy it um, because they are making a more black thermoform. Um, but, uh, but uh, it is uh, a very limited market at this point in time. Given the FDA ruling on allowing food grade HDPE to be produced from recycled content, do you see any future increase in reclaimed HDPE bottles? Uh, I don't see a, a lot of increase in HDP bottles because, gen quite frankly, there aren't, the, unless we can get more of them to the reclaimers. Um, there currently is more demand than supply, um, and so it's not a matter of ha the reclaimers having a place to, to sell them. Um, uh, I'm sure that the reclaimers would prefer to sell into a higher-end market like a bottle-to-bottle -bottle market where the value of their scrap is higher, so it will make them more profitable, but it, I, unless it's not a matter of pull-through with HTP bottles. It's a matter of where the heck are they? And why aren't they getting to the reclaimers? Um, why are we stuck at a 30% recycling rate for bottles? Um, I'm working with RRS, uh, in, uh, another consulting firm in um, Michigan, and some other folks. To uh, We have a study funded by a number of trade associations where, where we're going to be looking at what happens to the plastics in the MRF. Um, so one place we know that plastic is getting lost is in the MRF. It's ending up in the wrong bales, a lot in the paper and a lot in, in other places. So we're actually going to do a study where we try to determine how these materials behave in the MRF and how can we, is, are there systems or is there engineering that can take place that will, and that will put them in the correct place instead of in with the paper, for example. Um, but that's just one component. Um, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why we're stuck at 30%. I think in part it's it's uh, it's material getting lost at the MRF that could account for maybe 15% as much as 15% of the plastic or more that goes into the MRF ends up in the wrong place. Uh, I've seen one study that was uh, uh, close to 50% of the plastic that goes into the MRF ended up in the wrong place. Um, so that could give us a boost, but I think it's there's more to it than that. I think part of it's the consumer confusion. Um, if we can uh, get people to all understand what's recyclable and what isn't and, and stop confusing consumers, then they're more likely to put it in the recycling bin. Um, so uh, there's a number of things that will help us boost up the, the recycling of uh, HDPE, but um, uh, quite frankly, I don't think the, the food um, um, FDA thing is going to increase the collection. Okay, this question is concerning PLA, the polylactic acid plastics. Uh, is this still causing identification difficulties during sortation? And Patty, you might want to just explain what that what PLA is to some? Uh, PLA is polylactic acid. It's a plastic that's made um, from, uh, it's bio-based, uh, I believe currently made from corn. 
um, they turned corn into um, into uh, a, a lactic acid and then polymerized that essentially. Um, it's more complicated than that obviously, but I'm not a chemical engineer so I can't tell you how it happens. <laughs> you have to ask someone else about the engineering, the chemistry. Um, but uh, yeah, it's still an issue. They aren't in bottles anymore. They have pulled out of bottles. Um, but they are still in a lot of packaging. So one of the barriers, as I mentioned, for increasing the amount of PET thermoform um, is are the lookalikes, and PLA is one of the common lookalike materials. It looks a lot like PET. Um, so unless you um, have the capacity to auto sort, and even then, auto sort systems aren't 100%. Um, uh, they they have they uh, if to get at 100%, it would just be too slow. So they are not perfect. Um, so you, yeah, it is it is an issue. Um, uh, um, I know the PLA guys would like to get the PLA back to recycle it, but it, it's such a tiny portion of what's out there that it makes it. Uh, not uh, currently um, economic to to create a separate stream for it. It gets thrown away in okay, most cases, unless it's a commercial or I mean, a, excuse me, a specific event or something like that. Okay, this question uh, addresses uh, plastic grocery bags. Uh, they want to know if there's data available for the amount that are being produced. Uh, how much potential is there to collect, and how what is percent of this potential? Um, well, uh, th there is no data that I'm aware of on how much is being generated. Um, film, if you notice, we don't do a recycling rate report for film. We only do a recycling, um, you know, how much is being generated, and that's because it's very, and to do a rate, you have to have a numerator and a denominator. You have to know how much is being generated, and that's the very difficult one to come up with. Um, so we have never um, been able to get data on uh, how much uh, film, uh, either jet film in general or uh, film in bags, bags in specific, are being generated. Um, um, the grocery, uh, the retail industry, some of them aren't real happy with uh, with us because we are suggesting that they are the best place to collect this material, and they don't always agree with that. Um, um, so they're not gonna uh, jump right up and give Patty that data. That's for sure. Um, and, but there is a tremendous potential, and and you know, really, it's a matter of letting most consumers still don't understand that they can take their bags and all those other wraps. There's a website, I think it was the, the, uh, the last page of, of my uh, slides, uh, plastic, I, I, well, you can get there by uh, plasticfilmrecycling.org. And on that, that website is both for consumers and recycling coordinators and retailers and, and, and buyers of pla uh, film scraps. So it really runs the gamut. And on that, we have a, a, a search engine where consumers can put their, um, their uh, zip code in and find a store that will take their material back. Um, on that note, if anybody ever finds an issue or a mistake with that, if you look and you know of one that isn't in there or you find one that is in there and doesn't no longer takes it, please let us know um, because we're it's a constant struggle to keep that up to date. But we feel it's really important that consumers understand that this is a, a highly recyclable material and not just the bags. Um, I like to think of the bags as the you know the the, the, the stepchild, but but of of the film recycling. But what it has done is raise awareness of the issue, and um, and has essentially built the infrastructure to collect what is much more numerous and more pounds available, which is all that other film. Um, you know, um, we need to continue to encourage people to bring their own bag back. And uh, I have people tell me. Well, Patty, people are never going to bring material to the grocery store, right? So if you believe they aren't going to change their behavior to go to the grocery store and bring their bag back, then they're not ever going to bring their reusable bag back either. To, to, it's the same behavior change. We need to get them to bring their reusable bag. Oh, and while you're doing that, take that bag of bags and, and bring it to the store. The bags and wrap. And, and uh, so I am very um, encouraged and encouraging to people that there is a tremendous opportunity to to capture that material that we shouldn't squander okay th thanks patty uh we do have a bunch more questions but unfortunately we are out of time 
Uh, so again, Patty will be forwarded these questions and hopefully she can answer them offline. So uh, in closing, yeah, I'd like, I like to state this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, have been recorded and will be available for viewing as a YouTube video. Links to these videos can be found at, uh, on both the National Recycling Coalition and the Recycling Market Center websites. So again, thank you for joining us. We hope you will join us for next month's webinar scheduled for Tuesday, June 18th at 1.30 uh, Eastern Time. And again, uh, thank you, Patty, for taking the time for this presentation. It was very excellent. And uh, uh, have a good day, everybody. And uh, thank you. see you next time.